Hello again, my name is Steve Hillis and this is one of a continuing series of videos on methodology and sociology. Here we're going to be looking at research design and how it relates to internal validity. Research design is all about how we plan and execute our research. Now, exactly what issues come up in research design will vary according to what you're studying, what questions you're asking, what your research question is. Here we're going to focus very much on trying to test causal theories. And the issue will be, are we really testing the theory? Can you even tell what the results mean? Are we able to isolate the effect of important variables? Can we tell how one variable is causing another? Whether we're able to do so will largely depend on how we go about doing our research. And that will depend on, well, how we design our research. You have to approach it as a logic problem and as a practical problem. You have to basically do your research in such a way where you can really logically, rigorously test your theories, where the results of your theory make it very clear whether the theory worked well or not, whether the theory's predictions actually came true or not. Again, you want to be able to isolate the effects of various variables on other variables and control for other variables that might contaminate or, or, or in various ways corrupt your, uh, your research. It's a game of logic and it's a game that really requires a tremendous amount of preparation and planning. Now, if you go back to one of our earlier videos, we pointed out that there's three basic criteria that we use to demonstrate uh, that there's a causal relationship. There's correlations, there's establishing proper time order, or talking about which way the causal arrow points. Does X cause Y or does Y cause X? You have to figure that out. And also, you have to try to deal with other variables, third variables, sometimes called the problem of spuriousness. You're trying to eliminate spuriousness. You're trying to isolate the effect of one variable on the other. And really, that really means that you have to control for other things. How do you control for those other things? Well, once again, you have to figure that out. You actually have to do it when you do research. And depending on how well you do it, that will, depend, that will uh, shape how good your research is, how meaningful, how useful, how valid it is. Now, uh, we're not going to be able to talk about every possible approach or method. Uh, the the, the uh, whole topic of research design really is a very abstract, complex, broad topic. So again, let's focus a little more on one specific method for here and now. Let's look a little bit at experimental methods because experimental methods may be the most powerful uh, 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 methods we have in terms of research design for producing internally valid research, research that holds up, research that we can have a lot of confidence in that the results actually mean what they seem to mean. Experiments give us a wide range of tricks and tools that we can use when we're designing research to effectively test causal theories. For one thing, we have to make comparisons. A lot of research design is really the art of and science of comparison. In this case, we're comparing groups of people or groups of subjects in terms of something about them, some characteristic behavior or so forth. Now, let's say you're, for example, you're uh, giving people uh, blood pressure pills. You give one group blood pressure pills and then you give another group, I don't know, uh, 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 some kind of a placebo, a sugar pill. The first group that got the blood pressure pill is the uh, experimental group. They got the treatment, they got the stimuli. Then you create another group, in this case, one uh, control group. The point here is you're going to compare the blood pressure of the experimental group and the control group, one group getting the real medication, the control group getting the fake medication, and then after they got that, you wait a while, and then you take their blood pressure. Notice the underlying logic. The logic is simply comparing different groups who were exposed to different stimuli, and then drawing the inference from that that the only logical difference was, was that one group got the pill and one group didn't. Now, it may seem obvious, but take a step back. When you're doing that, you have to make an implicit assumption, and that assumption is that the two groups are more or less clones of one another. They're identical. You are comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Because if it's not true, if the two groups differ in other ways, 
other than just one took the pill and one didn't, then it becomes much harder to interpret the results. So for example, let's say you have a lot of heavy people, uh, people who are obese in one group. And another group got, uh, or the other group uh, is much thinner on average, or much younger, or maybe it's made up of more women compared to the first group. Maybe those differences might explain why different groups had different blood pressures, apart from whatever effect the blood pressure medication may or may not have had. You see, you're trying to make this research so that you can isolate, identify, and measure the effectiveness of the blood pressure pill. And if it doesn't seem to influence blood pressure in the way that you desire or expect, you basically are falsifying its effectiveness. It's very similar to falsifying causal theories in sociology. Same basic underlying logic. But notice in either case, you have to engage in making logical comparisons. Now, when we do experiments, uh, experimental researchers have powerful methods and tools to create groups that are usually fairly equivalent. Because if we can compare apples to apples, and then we can show one group, say, a political ad, and another group sees something different, then we give them a quiz or somehow elicit information from them, and they answer differently. If the two groups are virtually identical to start out with, then it becomes more logical to say, hey, look, why did one group behave differently than the other, react differently than the other? Well, it was because one group saw the ad and one group watched something else then the logic becomes much tighter and we can begin to, to basically ferret out what's going on and isolate out effects. Really what you're doing is trying to create groups that are virtually identical. Now there's no magical solution, but what experimental researchers have found out is that using random assignment, creating these groups literally randomly, picking people at random, putting them in a control group, an experimental group, well, that creates groups that at least on average are very similar to each other, not just in a single respect, but in many respects. In fact, they may very well be similar to each other in ways that the experimenter isn't even aware of. Now, again, it isn't magic. These groups sometimes, even when they're created using random assignment, can sometimes be very, very different. That's the way randomness works. But randomness tends to create groups, random assignment, I should say, tends to create groups that are very similar. And ultimately, if we're worried about creating groups that are unusually different in unexpected ways, we could repeat our research, or we could use larger experimental and control groups. It wouldn't totally eliminate the problem, but it would reduce it greatly. It turns out that random assignment is a powerful technique, not just for creating experimental and control groups, and making logical comparisons, but simultaneously dealing with all that stuff about spuriousness. Turns out that what you're really doing is controlling for other variables in a real simple, powerful way. If you're worried about gender, race, weight, intelligence, college education, all these things indirectly somehow influencing blood pressure, well, use random assignment. Create fairly large experimental and control groups. Give one group the pill, the other group doesn't get it. And with a little luck and a lot of hard work, you may be able to create groups that are very similar in all these other ways. Then that comparison makes sense. And what you're really doing is kind of isolating the effect of the pill away from all these other possibly confusing, confounding, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, contaminating effects of third variables. You're eliminating or at least minimizing the problem of spuriousness.